grew up with uh, uh, business of making harness and horses. So when I left school, I automatically drifted into it. That's what we call a plow gauge, this. You can, it's graduated, you can cut it what width one wants. That's for a bridging seat with a brown set of harness I'm making. Now we want what we call a girth. That's inch and a quarter wide. We've made the trace. Well, Andrew has some of that. My great-grandfather was a blacksmith at a place called Layston in Suffolk. And uh, it was a hard work job, blacksmithing in those days, but there was plenty of business. But he wanted uh, an easier job for one of his sons. He had two sons, and uh, the first was Sam Howard, my grandfather. He apprenticed him to become a harness maker. He did the five years apprenticeship. And after that time, you should go for another couple of years as improver, that you should get a bit more money, about another two bob a week. From five shillings, I think it went up to seven. But this saddler wouldn't give him. <laughs> he would say, no, couldn't afford it. So he said, right, oh, then I'll leave. So he, he just uh, packed his tools in a little bag and said goodbye, sir. And that was uh, 1860 when he started in the Oxford. My dad was born, I think, 1886. There was a good big business in, at Framlingham in Suffolk in the 1900s. Granddad bought it and pushed my dad into it to run it. Well, that's, uh, that's, that was the start of Howard's in Framlingham, harness makers. He married, of course, and I appeared in 1913. The oldest boy again, and another boy. And he had five boys and four girls. And when I left school in 1929, I just became a saddle and harness maker. Then 1933, Dad died. Left me, boss, with all these little wolves to bring up. Well, at the end of the war, uh, I came out, got married, and uh, carried on harness making. My mother was really boss of the business then, had me, and she carried on during the war. I left three men there, and I kept the business intact. And I came back, but as soon as farmers could get petrol and tractors and tyres, and the same with other public, they just stopped the horses and paid them off. Just fed them in the corner of a field, and uh, there wasn't much trade for harness making. However, I had four daughters, and I thought something got to be done, so I bought a, a newsagent shop, booksellers, and stationery. My wife ran that, and I did leather goods. I rather sort of diversified a bit. I didn't keep on harness. I did, but there wasn't so much to do. I made suitcases, uh, folios and school bags, gold bags, anything like that, strapping. However, um, I didn't, a son didn't arrive, only another daughter and another daughter, so I said something got to be done. Uh, so I thought, right, Australia or Canada or South Africa. Glad I didn't go to Canada after hearing what my good daughter said yesterday, anyhow. So I came to South Australia, thinking the girls could do something and I could, uh, catch a kangaroo or something. Painter's got a job, the plumber's got a job, the electrician's got a job, everybody. 
Till it comes to Kenny Howard. Outlook was not too good for me, the old man. He was a lovely old chap. He said, saddle and harness back. He said, haven't been asked for one for 40 years. <laughs> and uh, I said, good heavens. He said, there's no such thing here. And there wasn't in Adelaide. Uh, well, it's not a trade one. Uh, it's not apparent much, although there are arson shops. So he said, we were right to, he said, you'll have to go on in a factory somewhere, I expect, or go to Holton's. You can do something. However, he said, we'll have a look. So he looked at the files, box of files, and got up saddle and harness maker. Christ, he said, uh, there is one wanted. Williams is a prospect. He said, wanted one bin. Uh, this was February, this was. He said, they want one urgently November. So he said, hop on the bus and get to Williams's, and you've got the job. If you can make a saddle, or if, you can, if you're good. So I got to Williams's and went up into the factory and there was nine saddlers, there were supposed to be, there were nine people working at the bench, the adventures, and uh, I saw the gaffer, Albert Burgess, and uh, I said, I, here you want a saddler. Oh, he said, badly, if you, can you make a saddle? I said, oh yes. So, uh, he said, not the strap hand or just the bridle hand. And I'm not very clever, but it was my job. You, uh, no need to boast, but I, I couldn't do anything else. So he said, can you make one of those? It was a uh, jumping saddle, Italian one. I said, in the dark. He said, right, and he said, you've got the job. I was getting well known in the old firm, and uh, we were quite happy until I thought I'd get a living on my own. And the further education wanted some lecturers on saddlery and leather workers. So I took that job. That was evenings then, which supplemented my wages. My daughters were growing up, they all became nurses, and so we were reasonably comfortable. And then I started on my own here and lecturing during the afternoons and evenings, further education. Then I found one or two boys. I couldn't do it all myself. I wanted some assistance. So we learned of, uh, uh, there was a neat scheme and different schemes ran by the government and the Australian Council. If you didn't want a job, just come up on a motorbike and uh, with a beard. If you wanted a proper sort of dedicated horse boy. And eventually I found them. I found Oh, as a matter of fact, I found Jamie Alcock. He was a perfect nuisance, he was. He used to come uh, on his own every night, motor out here from Yankalilla. Oh, he was crazy about making his old gear. And eventually, I thought it shouldn't be wasted. I thought, I can't afford to pay you anything, or not much, because for a long time you can't make things, you can't produce anything. Not in my little place. You can in a factory, you can find them a job. So we got him a grant from the Australian Council, which they paid him a living allowance, and they paid me a, a little to teach him. And it was magnificent. He was with me three years, and he was a real good boy. But he wanted a bit refining. I hadn't kept up with the English, the European saddlery, and things were altering after the war. The show jumping and events were different and they had altered saddles a little bit. So I said, you ought to go to England. So we got him a Churchill Fellowship, and he went there for a year. Then again he went, and he came back. I gave up teaching. Jamie took over from me, and I think the future's all right for Jamie. Now I want, this is a folded girth, I want all buckles put on like that, that's what I'm doing now. Uh, well, having cut the, the strips off and taken the edge off them, they're rough. You've got to put some stain on uh, to make it look a posh job. You can buy synthetic dyes and things, but we were brought up, lived in the country, we made our own. We didn't buy to the chem you couldn't rush to the chemist because there's no chemists, not in those days, not to buy powder. So what we used to get is oak bark, oak tree. You know what an oak tree is? We used to get some of that bark off, soak it in water, boil it up, and it comes like strong tea, which is ideal. It, it makes a, you can uh, dilute it or uh, use it, or depends what color you want. And then you get some, boil it up to make a nice solution, and then you want it to shine. So you get what we call joiner's glue. The 
a little of that, put it in the solution, that dissolves, and it shines. It's a trick. You can buy uh, factories, don't do that. They send to the, they got more money, and you boil it up, and it makes a nice solution. And you see, and you, and it shines. Here you can't get oak bark, we use wattle bark or gum bark, anything. It, if you seep it in water, it, it, it gets a nice dark brown colour. And you do that, and then you rub them up like that, and it shines. But it's still not finished yet. We've got to, what we call, make a edge on, a crease. You've seen a mark on all strapping. On a new set of harness, you heat your iron, and that sort of makes a, a more definite mark. But for this little job, that will do. To make our holes in leather, we don't cut them, we have punches. Those are buckle hole punches. Those are, they make a long mark when you bend your little The tongue can work, buckle hole punches. Uh, for gig harness, we use oval punches. It makes a neater hole for them. They, uh, they're all numbered. The round ones, buckle hole punches, and oval. Uh, we always think an oval punch looks nicer than a round one. Uh, having made a mark down the leather and you want to sew it, uh, you don't just uh, get your needle and thread and fling in everywhere, anywhere. You prick it. Uh, that's why the pricking iron is six to the inch, five to the inch, ten to the inch, fourteen, fifteen stitches to the inch, so that uh, then you make your hole there, pull your threads up, all your sewing looks nice and even. Uh, and, oh, they think it's like, like machine, but it isn't at all cheated because we made the mark uh, first, really. That's a saddler's thread. You twist it till that's all runs right up the top there. That's just, that's a good thread. What Andrew is using is the saddler's clams. You can't just put your piece of leather between your knees or on your bench. You've got to get it rigid so you can just push your all in, put your thread through and pull it up. It's a bent piece of willow and it's sprung. Your hands are free, your work is in front of you, level with the top of your bench. And in a big factory, you have about 40 of these all along where the, the sowers used to just sit and sew get them different sizes and they used to pay half a crown a pair. Now they're thirty-two dollars. That's just another thing. We didn't have machines not years ago. My grandfather never knew what a machine was, nor did my father. I don't believe in them because with a machine there is a whole continuous thread on the top, there is a whole continuous thread at the bottom. It secures the leather, it looks all right, but supposing by wear or accident one of those stitches get cut, it releases that one so you could pull the whole top or bottom thread out. Saddlers with a saddle stitch, they sit up there with the clams with a piece of leather and they've got one great big piece of thread and it's about six feet long. You put a needle on each end of it and you pierce the next hole with the awl, put the left hand needle through, get the right hand needle, push that through the same hole, pull up, and you pull them tight. If you cut one of those stitches, you, it doesn't release anything. In England, you, you use what we call neat's leather, and that was cow hides. For all the bullocks were slaughtered, and the hides were just sent to the tannery, and you used bullock hide, for harness leather, bridle leather, saddle leather, except for the seats. In those days, they used pigskin. You did use sheepskin for the underneath of the saddle. But uh, those are the only leathers we used. There was some Moroccan goat, but we didn't use it in the saddlery trade. And when I came to Australia, you used the same thing. So I made some saddle rolls one day for Williams's. And I said, I'll send the boy down for some leather. And he said, yes, get some kangaroo. He said, kangaroo. And I'd never used kangaroo, not in England. And it's marvellous. Oh, it's tough. It's nice and thin, but it's tough. 
where the lugs of wire it does. And uh, so versatile. These old kangaroo uh, live a hard life, and they're shot and then skinned and sent to the tannery, and it's beautiful stuff. Bullock hide is made into bridle leather, harness leather, saw leather, all sorts of things, and different thicknesses. Kangaroo is just thin, but there's so many jobs you can use. You can get goat. There's a lot of goats uh, up in Arcarola here, and that's very good leather. But there's a job for each, you see. But the only thing you can't get in Australia is pigskin. That has to come from England. A side saddle, the lady uh, has not uh, put a leg each side. She sits on this side. Her right leg comes over there. Her left leg comes up there, so her knee is there. And there's a stirrup iron comes down there, so she's fairly secure because the, the, this is in the stirrup. Well, the construction of the saddle is just the same as, any, uh, as an ordinary saddle. You, you're given the wooden tree and you seat it up, you cut your flaps out, you've got to make these two damn things. Uh, they call them leaping heads now, we used to call them crutches. Uh, they're quite uh, interesting things to make, takes your day, but the workers, uh, you, you stretch the seat on, uh, you stuff it up, you web it all up, and stuff the seat up, and then cover it with pig skin, stretch it over, let it dry, but then you've got to sew this, the flap, onto this all the way round and this side just the same. Well, in fitting a saddle, uh, it is important to get the tree to fit. And to do that, one has to have a piece of malleable piping like that and bend it, bend it to the horse's withers so that you can get the fitting. Then we get that out like that, and we put that on a piece of paper and arc round it. If we haven't got a tree, we send to the tree makers and get that shape. And then the tree is made like that, and from there, we build the saddle. Saddle tree making, I believe, is the second oldest profession in the world. There is only one older. The name tree comes from the fork of a tree which they used to cut and use in the early days to put over the back of the horse for riding on. My dad uh, started as a boy. He served his apprenticeship as a tree maker, saddle tree maker, at about 13 years of age. In his early 20s, he was a foreman at a factory at Lycan, and then he went on his own, and after that he came here and went into partnerships with two chaps here. And uh, I came in about 22 years ago. Foride are the only manufacturer of timber trees in as much as that we cover the whole range. There, there are uh, two brothers in Melbourne that do manufacture timber trees, but I believe they only cover the race and the show style, whereas we go right through the whole range. Our trees are made uh, currently out of beech, New Zealand beech. It's quite a good timber, it's fairly straight grained. It's strong, reasonably strong, and reasonably hard, which is what you need. Well, with the timber trees, we start off with our patterns. We mark the pattern onto a piece of timber. It's cut around on the bandsaw, sanded, marked with a particular pattern to give you the, what we call the sweep. And we trim them again on the bandsaw, and they're sanded into the, the shape required. Then they're taken to another section where they're covered in a cheesecloth, pasted on. And once that's dry, they're uh, painted with a red oxide solution. Then after that, they go to the plater and he fits his plates, cuts his holes, puts his rivets in and rivets the rivets down. Once the stirrup bars are on, they're sent away to the saddler. Well, I don't think much of plastic trees. The plastic, as you know, or you may not know, after about four or five years, it starts to fatigue and it cracks and goes hard. And uh, then it deteriorates and falls to pieces. Well, a timber tree can last 40 or 50, even 60 years if it's looked after. Uh, that's what we call an Australian stock saddle. There's all sorts of uh, varieties of those, but that's what I would call a colt saddle. The idea, we don't have them in England, uh, 
the nearest you can get to them is a western saddle. Uh, the idea is for the stockman who rides these horses, he's, he's there to work. He's got to get your cattle, he's got to have a, a, a whip to drive these uh, stock about, or he's got to have a lasso to, uh, to catch them and he's got a, what we call muster cattle. He's got to sit in there and be able to do all sorts of things. The idea is to have these great big pads here. You get into the saddle and these grip your, uh, up the side of your thigh. You're like, uh, that's like an anchor. You, you can then, you feel safer. Your, your feet are in the stirrups like an ordinary saddle, of course, but you feel these each side of you. You've uh, you're got a lot of support and it's very, very deep. Uh, so you're, uh, you're, once you're there, you'll you, you get a lot of confidence. Well, this horse is harnessed up with a bridle, breastplate, saddle, backband and tugs, uh, trace, crupper and britchens and shaft straps. The idea of this type of harness is for a horse to go in shelves. Uh, not with a pole, but with a pair of shelves which come through there one on this side, one on the other, which supports a vehicle. The idea is for the horse to go forward to pull the vehicle. The only way of doing that is make what we call either a neck collar or a breast collar, hook some trace on the other end on the vehicle. The, the vehicle is suspended by the shafts through the shaft tugs. Shafts come along, trace is hooked onto the swingle tree or the mental bar or the hooks each side of the car. The horse goes forward and drags the car. When I left Williams's, I was making all sorts of things, and there was a fellow, a Clydesdale dealer, up in Queensland. He couldn't get any collars made. He wrote to me and said, would I make him some Clydesdale harness? I said, yes. But I said, what do you want all this for? And he said, for Don Ross. I said, why? He said, he's got a big team, a 20-horse team in the Irishman. And he said, we find your, <laughs> your harness just what he wanted. So I, when I came home, I saw the Irishman at the films, and I went and saw my horse at Hardest. <laughs> this last ten years, horses are coming back. They're back in England, they're back in Europe, they're back in Australia. It's because there's more money about. But there's more money coming into a house, so the parents have got more money to buy a horse. It's good, clean fun. People are tending to go away from sort of motorbikes and things like that, I think. Events on a weekend, pony clubs, gym carners, things like this, and the parents approve of it because there's a certain amount of status to it. The saddler is still expensive, but it's long lasting. Riding has improved. They used to be all so formal, the old Europeans did. English just the same. Argentines, a little more wiry. They'd got a different sort of saddle, but we didn't know about that till the top Tani. He was an Italian count after the war. He said, why do we have such a great thick solid tree in a riding saddle? Which was sensible, you don't need them. And he went to the tree makes and said, can you put a spring in that? Which made it more flexible. I think since the war, the design of the saddlery, the jumping and the racing and exercising and dressage as different. Everything is made lighter, more flexible. The modern huntsman or the dressage person has got different ideas. So has the military man. The equestrians today have got away from them rigid ideas and they found out that if they wanted the saddle cut a little bit different, the saddle would do it for him. We were always instructed to make a thing better than everybody else. It's got to be perfect. You've got to make a saddle or a bridle or a collar or anything so that you were happy with it. Things are different today, and the philosophy is, is different. Uh, you just make the thing and you say, oh, it's you, I don't. Uh, it's just said, oh, she's right, that'll do. Well, it won't do. You've got to do the thing so that you're happy with it. And so when you're in bed at night, you're not worrying about somebody's stirrup leather breaking. <laughs> <laughs>